Hello class, I uh, hope you don't mind my outdoor aesthetic for uh, homiletics preaching on James 3, but let's begin. So I remember as a kid uh, realizing very early on that I loved audio listening. I loved and retained a lot of knowledge through that. Uh, to this day, I could probably quote you a bunch of Adventures in Odyssey episodes because everywhere I went, I had my bag with my audio tape player, my tapes from Adventures in Odyssey, and all those extra AA batteries. Uh, it was something that I always had with me and I could listen to and learn. And so I've kind of adapted that into my adulthood with being one of those other people that recommends podcasts to you. One of them that I really appreciated recently was uh, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. In it, it tells the tragic story of a church that rose up really quickly and then it just kind of imploded overnight and nobody knew what exactly happened. And when you ask different people, you got different stories. And so the podcast was just trying to trace down the story of why did it come up so quickly and why were so many people hurt by it. And ultimately, it's, I won't spoil too much, but if you know the name Mark Driscoll, you realize that there was a the same old story that happens with so many other churches. It was a charismatic leader who knew the right words to say. Well, he said really good words that people like to hear. And then behind the scenes, there was issues that didn't get dealt with. And many people were hurt because of it. Sadly, this is all too true among church leadership. It's something that is a common story that I could probably pull out a, a handful of them out of a bag to say, these are all cases of leaders. And how can we as a community or recognize as a church the issues that go on in the church with our leadership and those who teach and making sure that issues like this don't happen. James 3 is one example of that, where we learn the idea of teaching with caution, or specifically to teach with a controlled tongue and godly wisdom. And James 3 kind of lays that out. He starts with the warning, but then quickly moves into all the ways that which the tongue can be devastating, its power, its destruction, potential, and how inconsistent it is. And then also how godly wisdom isn't just something that you uh, just kind of get out of ethereal air, but rather it's something that is a lived out lifestyle of humility. So let's read through the passage together. I'll be using my computer to read through the passage. So the first idea that we're going to catch is the idea of how to teach with caution. We learn this from verses three, or sorry, chapter three, verses one to two. James writes, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. So again, this first idea that we catch is to teach with caution. Uh, the statement couldn't be clear at the beginning. He says, you should not consider to become a teacher very lightly. Why? Well, it's simple. Teachers receive a stricter judgment. And it's not that God's going to weigh them out and say, well, these people taught, so they have to do more. Rather, it's the fact that their influence goes further. You see, teachers have a greater influence because they're the ones who pass on the morals and standards that they have to their disciples. And while this especially applies to church leadership, I, I want to make clear from the beginning and throughout, if you find yourself ever teaching in the church, this applies to you. So whether you're in Sunday school or a parent or actually a pastor or an elder in a church, the, everyone who you teach and the more opportunities and influence that you have for that, the more this should be a strict warning for you as well to not easily become a teacher. Knowing that the more words that you say reads more risk for judgment. Jesus himself talked about how every idle word will be weighed against the judgment in the last day. So the more you speak, the more you have to consider this. And the caution is important. Uh, it'd be like taking this can of soda here. Some people like to think that when you shake up a can of soda, that it'll explode. But that's kind of half true. You see, if I were to open it right now, it would explode. But until it's punctured or released in some way, the content, contents, the power of it is contained. So too, it, also with teachers, when teachers are a little bit slower to speak or don't quickly give their opinions on things, they can be like this can of soda. Sometimes teachers have let the emotions come up in them or sinful passions can easily become tempting to say things or to kind of lord authority over people. But it's important to catch that if they don't speak, they're actually more likely to pass, if you could say, or to not pass on sinful behavior. And it's only when it's opened that it becomes dangerous. And so one practical considerations of the idea of teaching with caution 
is just like what James said earlier in chapter one. He said to be slow to speak and quick to listen. It's something that comes all too easy for those who want to teach, to let their opinion be known. But just like even the Proverbs say, if you have that time and that space before you speak, sometimes you can prevent a lot of disaster. So teach with caution. The second idea we have is to control your tongue. And we're going to see that second idea in three different parts. James likes to use a lot of illustrations, and so we're going to break them down a little bit. The first one is the idea of the power of the tongue. We catch this in verses 3 through the first half of verse 5. He says, Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look, also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. So again, the second point overall is the idea of controlling your tongue as a teacher. And I'll iterate again, wherever you have opportunity to teach, this still applies to you. And the first part is the idea of the power of the tongue. He uses two analogies. The first with the idea of a a bit in a horse's mouth. And it's extra appropriate how this fits because it goes right into the mouth of the horse and it's able to turn the entire body. If someone, a teacher, is able to control the words that they say, a lot of the rest of their life will be worked out practically. Or similarly, the second illustration he uses is the idea of a small rudder on a sailboat. Something that I think is hard to appreciate with the invention of the steamboat and the modern, you know, if you've ever been on a boat, you're probably not sailing. Uh, My brother, I appreciate him a lot. He gets into all these fixations with hobbies and one of them was sailing, actual like wind sailing with the whole bit. And he invited me one day. And as we got onto the boat, um, he showed me how to use the different sails. There's two lines so that you can guide the boat which way you want to go and capture the wind the best way. And then he showed me how to use the rudder. And I was quickly taken off guard when I was holding the rudder. We started moving through the water, how much force I had to hold it with. At one point, I started to lean on the rudder and the boat started to shift. And my brother looked back at me and said, no, 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 you've got to control the rudder. You don't just hold it. And that stuck with me. Even this passage came to mind as I was on the water of the, of the San Diego Bay there, that it's something that you control. It's not something that you just maintain. It's an active process to control the power of the tongue. A simple way in which we can apply this is just having that gap before we actually use our words and speak. Rather than just saying the first thing that comes to our mind, the more important that your words are, in the given moment, the more intentionally you should be to practice them. There should be a gap when you're trying to say something really well. You know, we have to have conversation, and that doesn't leave room for a lot of back and uh, a lot of pause. But the more something matters, or the more confrontational you might be, or the more you're going to teach something, the more you might practice it. You could even say for something like a preaching class, how all of this is just preparation because this is going to matter later on in our lives. Uh, the second idea of how we control the tongue is because of the devastating nature of the tongue, or the destruction of the tongue. We learn this from verses 5, the second half of 5 to 8, where he writes, See how great a forest a little fire kindles. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature and of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. So again, how do we control the tongue? Well, we recognize its destructive nature. The tongue is something that is small and powerful, and that power is able to come out in all kinds of wicked ways. He uses two main analogies here. The first one is of a fire. Living in San Diego, we've had so many fires that all it took was a little cigarette butt, a little spark to kindle up the whole countryside, the whole county. And we're all too familiar with all of the devastating reports that come on our phones because of that. And it doesn't start with a lot. It starts with a little fire and it ignites to the whole area and causes that destruction. So too with teachers, the way that they teach or if they teach badly, poorly, that destruction that causes that individual could ruin their whole life even to the point of being their condemnation of them rejecting the gospel. That's part of what it means when it says the tongue is set on fire by hell. 
its devastation leads to that. The other analogy that he uses to talk about the destruction that it could do is like a wild, untamed animal. We've been able to, you know, tame many animals. We already talked about horses. There, there's some animals, though, that are untamable, that will never be within our control. He even references uh, some old ideas in the old, uh, Hebrew Bible, this idea of the beast or the bird. These are all examples of unruly things. You even see in the parable of the sower and the seed when the bird comes, it's attributed to Satan, something that is uh, unruly or uncontrollable force in the gospel going out. Or even he mentions the idea of reptiles or creatures of the sea. Often in the Old Testament, you hear this word Leviathan. Uh, it's something that God boasts about in the book of Job and says that no one can tame it, but I know that it's there and I'm aware of it and I'm sovereign over it. God allows these evil forces in the world and knows that man can't do anything about it or we are unable to tame it ourselves. And that is exactly how James replies it to the tongue. He says that the tongue is full of deadly poison. It is like an untamed beast, a leviathan with venomous poison coming out of it, able to destroy things. And that is something that should be a little sobering to us, that if it's so potential, its potential is so able to be destructive, we need to know how to practice and deal with it. Uh, I remember as a kid, uh, it was alone for a little bit of time. I needed a little bit of dinner. And so I go to the kitchen. I'm going to, I don't know, find, find something. And I go and I, I guess we have a potato. I don't know how to cook potatoes. So I find a knife and I didn't realize uh, what kind of knife it was. It was about three inches long and a little curved and very thin. And as I go to cut the potato, it jumps on me and slices my finger really deep. And I didn't realize what I was using. I was using a bone marrowing knife, like a boning knife. This is something that is way sharper and not the right tool for the job. And me being the uh, foolish lad that I was, started trying to cut it again after cleaning up my finger and cut myself again. I didn't realize the power that that knife had and how to wield it correctly or what its purpose was. So too, teachers need to realize that their words, their mouths, are like that knife. Now, that doesn't mean we never use knives again. Rather, it's saying there's a purpose for it. And so while James does talk about how no man is able to tame the tongue, I think there's a little bit of hyperbolic language here. Rather than saying that it's impossible, or, or to put it another way, you could say, well, it's impossible that we don't sin, so why do we try to not sin? Rather, it's instead of saying, don't try, it's saying that's how difficult it is, so you're never going to be perfect at it. But rather, part of how the Holy Spirit works in our lives is to say, here's the words that you should teach when you should teach them, and let's practice them the more they matter. And so I would encourage as a way of application for this is to treat it like a knife. Treat your tongue like a, uh, like a sharp boning knife. Knowing its purpose, how it works, how our thoughts con convey different meanings, the process of how you formulate thoughts and how other people listen, and all of that is part of how we practice using our knives well or our tongues well. Not that it should never be used, but knowing that if it's used poorly, it could hurt not just yourself or my poor little fingers with the knife, but something more deadly and more hurtful to other people. So again, control the tongue, part one, the power of the tongue, the destruction of the tongue, part two, and now we see the inconsistency of the tongue. Because if the tongue was just powerful and destructive, we would never use it. But it's supposed to be used. It actually has a potential for good. The issue is this third sub-point here where it says that it's inconsistent. Look at verses 9 to 12. James says, With it, our tongue, we bless our God and Father. And with it we curse men who are, have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and curses. Our, my brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. So this last idea is that the tongue is inconsistent. And the irony of, of the tongue being inconsistent is that it can do good. We bless God with it. And James points out that irony of if we bless God, but then turn around and curse people, or he's given examples of being uh, not gracious to the poor, then you're a hypocrite. You, you, you're like a spring that's giving out both fresh water and salt water. Tell me, would you trust a spring that sometimes gave fresh water and sometimes gave poisonous water? You probably wouldn't. He also uses the idea of a fig tree. And that's not an incidental analogy of just any tree that can produce fruit. This is the analogy that's been used in the Old Testament over and over again. 
to talk about God's people. Isaiah talks about how God planted this beautiful tree, this fig tree or this grapevine, and how Israel, left to their own devices, took those grapes and let them be rotten, destroyed. Uh, and he uses, I think, that intentional analogy to say that you are God's people. And as God's people, you need to represent him well. Uh, tell me uh, this. When you go to a food restaurant, why do you choose to go there? I know for me, one of my favorite places to go is the Costco food, food court. And why do I go there to spend $3.76 on a hot dog, soda, and a pizza slice? Well, the reason is, you could say it's quality, you could say it's the friendly customer service, but it's not really those things. It's the fact that they're so consistent that when I go there, I know exactly what I'm going to get, how to exactly order, and it's going to be the same every single time within a reasonable variance. And so to you, when you choose a food place, while you might have different preferences and tastes how you're feeling the day, you choose to go to places that you can trust. You go somewhere, and if you don't know if the customer service is going to be good or the food is going to be the same quality every time, you tend not to go to those places. Consider that all the more so with teachers. What does it take to be a good teacher that somebody would come to and trust? Well, you have to be consistent as a teacher. And again, if you're, whether or not you're a pastor or an elder, if you're somebody in the church that other people are going to look up to for advice, you need to be able to be someone who's going to consistently give God the counsel. That doesn't mean the counsel is always the same. Again, sometimes you have to be more gentle and sometimes you have to be more firm. But throughout the entire time, it should always be in godly wisdom and love. And that'll lead to our third point, where we'll spend just a little bit of time talking about how James considers wisdom. So let's review. <clears throat> we first had the idea of how we need to teach with caution. Second, how we control our tongues. And then lastly, we need to exercise wisdom from above. Read with me verses 13 to 18. James writes, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So for this last point, let us consider the two ideas of how we exercise wisdom from above. He first emphasizes how there's wisdom from below. There is a selfish desire that can come up in teachers sometimes, and that comes up and springs up from pride. He says that if there's somebody wise among you, in other words, if we're looking for a teacher, you better show that in your lifestyle of humility. Driving here on the East Coast, we drove all the way up from North Carolina, from where my sister lives, all the way up to Pennsylvania, where I'm in now. And there was so many toll roads. It was so easy to get diverted to the wrong street. And it was very confusing. And all of a sudden, I found myself trying to figure out how to get in the right lane and not accidentally pay a toll. And ultimately, we made a wrong turn or two and paid some toll fees along the way. I say this story because it's a very fitting analogy to how sometimes pride seeps into a teacher's life. On the road of teaching, you have to get from point A to point B with somebody. But it's very easy to get to that destination by paying some fees of pride. And while in some regard, you might still teach the person, the danger in the prideful teacher is that they will not just teach the godly stuff, they'll teach their whole lifestyle, which includes pride. And that if we have teachers, they will reproduce themselves, the whole lot. And so part of how we exercise caution in this is knowing who our teachers are and how to weed out some of the issues. Then he goes into the idea of wisdom from above, and how do we exercise that? And he gives some descriptions of it. They're very similar to the fruits of the Spirit, how it's pure, peaceable, and gentle, and without partiality. So these are part of the signs in which we take them and how we understand how to live with wisdom from above. Uh, I personally have never wanted to do this, but I've watched other my, my wife want to create a, um, an avocado tree. There's been lots of videos online that she's been getting getting caught up in where you take an avocado, you put toothpicks in it, you kind of submerge it half in water and let a sprout grow from it. The only reason I would ever do that is because I'd want an avocado tree. 
that takes so much work. It, it takes cultivating, but germination period, digging in the dirt. And one of the hardest parts of avocado tree is getting them pollinated so they actually produce the fruit you want. But, man, I really love avocado trees. And I would go through all that work to enjoy that sweet fruit. That idea of uh, an avocado, you know, going from so uh, unripe to ripe overnight and being rotten, you'd be able to get the avocado exactly when you want it. And all that work would be worth it because of its goodness. So too with, with teachers, part of how we as a church make sure that we are reproducing what we want is by doing all this work to evaluate our those who teach, whether that's in our Sunday schools, whether that's informally, or whether that's the ultimate place of in front of the whole congregation. And while this takes a lot of work to make sure that we, our teachers are able to adequately control their tongues and exercise this wisdom, it is worth it. Uh, I, as a side note, would want to say that teacher, uh, any teacher in the church should be trained in the idea of counseling. And I couldn't recommend the book enough, uh, The Peacemaker by uh, Ken Sandy. He lays out a lot of principles of how to mediate. Because often, a lot of the work of a teacher isn't just on Sunday morning from the front pulpit, but it's all of the side conversations and mediating people's different issues. So as we consider how we conclude, I could end with a lot of stories of failed teachers. But I want to highlight one who was meaningful in my life. His name was Alan Sun. When I was a leader in InterVarsity, he had every right to kick me off the leadership team because of some of the ways in which I was teaching. I was prideful. But instead of being being rushed and harsh with me, he took his time. He came over, took me aside, praised me for the little aspects that he could, saying that I was being faithful, and was patient with me. He taught me with caution. He, he cultivated part of my heart to show the pride that I had, and that he worked slowly in me uh, using all of these things that we've talked about heavenly wisdom and humility to show me a better way he was like a can of soda because i could see that he was frustrated sometimes with me but instead of demonstrating that frustration he cooled off and after a little time was fine and gave me exactly what i needed and so for us whether you're a teacher in a church or not you will be teaching somebody or I should say whether you're a pastor in a church or not Whatever role that you find yourself in, take these to heart. Teach with caution, knowing that what you do matters and has an impact on their life. Knowing that you have to control your tongue. There's sometimes where emotions and pride are going to well up in you, and you have to be slow to speak, quick to listen, and more gracious and gentle. And exercise the wisdom from above. Show that long-suffering that Christ had for us, that when we were sinners, he died for us, and so we forbear with those who we teach, whether we're the big guy and the number one pastor or whether we're just the lay person i encourage us to teach with caution by controlling our tongues and exercising godly wisdom